Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're gonna keep walking through module three and we talked about Megalosauroidea last time. Today, we're gonna talk about the Carnosauria and uh, then we're gonna keep on moving in through the rest of the big carnivorous dinosaurs, get into the uh, raptors and the birds and then big old sauropods. But before we do that, uh, some announcements, please book that in your calendars uh, now. All right, so let's review what we talked about last time. So the Megalosauroidea we talked about last time. So how did the Megalosauridae uh, compete with larger carnivorous theropods? So uh, this is an example of a uh, Megalosauroidea, in this particular case, a ceratosaur. Uh, how did it compete with these much larger uh, allosaurids, which we're gonna talk about today? So this is from the Morris information is different. So what do you think? Uh, so generally, uh, these much larger, beefier, uh, stronger built uh, allosaurs, these carnosaurs, which we're going to talk about today, uh, generally, uh, they had very different hunting styles than these more slender uh, ceratosaurs. And so they probably hunted in different environments. These things are easier to get in and out of forests. They can creep into the underbrush a little bit better, navigate tighter spaces a little bit easier. And that's probably where they primarily lived, uh, which means they were probably targeting different prey that also lived in those different areas. So they weren't directly in competition with the larger, bigger, stronger carnivorous dinosaurs. They were filling a different niche in probably a somewhat different environment. Uh, not in a different location though, they were on the same continent in the same general area. They probably did overlap a little bit with each other. Uh, and again, there's no real evidence of them working together in packs that requires a degree of coordination and communication that uh, a lot of these dinosaurs, at least these more basal dinosaurs, are probably not capable of. As we move up the evolutionary chain here though, when we talk about, start talking about Solarosaurs, and the Manoraptora, the brains start getting relatively larger. And at that point, it might be possible. Uh, but again, we, we don't necessarily know. All right, so uh, we talked a lot about Spinosaur. We talked a lot about how kind of weird it was and how it's definitely changed through time. So uh, Spinosaur was most likely... Do we have the answer? The answer is that, you know, we, we really don't. Uh, it's kind of swung back and forth. So you can see reflected in toys, uh, looking at dinosaur toys over time is an interesting way of seeing how these ideas have changed uh, throughout throughout time, throughout pop culture. Um, you see again, like the quadrupedal with the big sail, uh, almost looking like a Dimetrodon here. In fact, that might be a Dimetrodon to the upright bipedal stance, uh, sort of reverting back to the ground, uh, the aquatic kind of version here dominating. So uh, there's still a lot of debate about whether it was a terrestrial biped, a semi-aquatic quadruped on all fours, or maybe even fully aquatic all the time with webbed feet never supporting the full weight of its body. Uh, there's still a lot of debate going back and forth. Only new fossil material and new analysis is going to help get us through this debate. Uh, eventually, we'll probably converge on something that we're a little bit more comfortable with. But right now, there's evidence pointing in kind of both directions. And so it's very difficult to align on what the true nature is. But uh, in theory, over time, we'll get more information. And with more information, we'll make better, uh, more informed uh, predictions and interpretations. And if new information comes along, we'll revise again. That's the scientific process. All right, so let's take a look at the Theropoda cladogram. So again, uh, we're going to talk about Sauropoda, Sauropodomorpha at the end of next week, uh, the big uh, quadrupedal herbivores. Uh, we've been talking about theropods, the bipedal carnivores. We talked about the basal members here, Coelophysoidea and Dilophosaurus. Uh, we talked about them. We talked about the ceratosaurs, the abelosaurs. We talked yesterday about the Megalosauroidea, the Spinosaurs, Megalosaurs. Uh, now we're going to talk about the carnosaurs here, which includes these two big groups, the Allosauridae and the Carcarodontosauridae. And so we're going to talk about these today. And then next time, we're going to talk about the Solarosauria, which includes T Rex, which I'm sure everybody's probably looking forward to. Uh, and then eventually, we'll talk about the Manoraptorans, the actual, uh, the, the quote unquote, avian dinosaurs. All right, so let's start in the Allosauridae. So, Allosauridae 
uh, translates to different lizards. So Allo is different. And Saurus, as we've seen a hundred times before, is lizard. So different lizards. Uh, and that's named after kind of this odd hourglass shaped vertebrae that they have. So you see this uh, very prominent uh, re recess on all around the vertebrae to kind of give it this hourglass shape. Uh, there's also this sort of ventral groove in here. So uh, dorsal, like a dorsal fin is on the back, ventral is on the belly. So this is pointing downwards on the animal. Uh, there's this groove here. Um, these uh, reductions in the skeletal mass here are probably to kind of lighten up the skeleton. And so we're starting to see, we've seen all along this kind of trend in, in general, these carnivorous dinosaurs are starting to get larger and larger and larger, uh, probably in response to the prey getting larger and larger and larger. So like to hunt something as big as this Diplodocus, uh, you've got to be pretty substantial. And so this Allosaurus here, um, their body sizes are, are getting larger. Uh, their killing capacity is getting better. Uh, they're developing new and different, more effective hunting strategies. So we talked about before kind of the limited bite capacity where those earlier blunt-nosed dinosaurs uh, might have had to have relied on kind of death by a thousand cuts and more like pursuit predation where they were constantly just kind of picking at and just finally just tire it out from blood loss and just running it out. Uh, we're starting to see these evolutions here where you're actively chomping and biting and grasping and directly killing with the bite force. Um, so these Allosaurids, uh, they're very prominent in the late Jurassic of North America and Eurasia, primarily the, the northern continents. Uh, on the Gondwanan continents, those ceratosaurs are still uh, very dominant, or the abelosaurs, I should say. Um, so uh, one feature that we see in the Allosauridae are these uh, the three-digit hands. So before we've been dealing with uh, four digits, I should go like this because it's the pinky that's lost in most of the earlier years. Uh, now we start to lose the ring finger and Allosaurids have three fingers on the hands. Uh, they have reduced forelimbs, so their forelimbs are small, uh, but they're still very strong and very mobile. They're not fixed like in like say Carnotaurus, where you have those like la kind of laughably small arms. Uh, another feature that we see in most of them uh, are the, the dual uh, keratinous crests that kind of go up the snout kind of to the eye, which you can see here on this reconstruction. Uh, and another thing that we see with these Allosaurids is that uh, the jaw gape, the angle that their jaws can open to is uh, quite large. And this is sort of a new adaptation. And it's an adaptation that we also see in big cats. Uh, dogs can also, uh, canines can also open their mouths fairly wide, but not as wide as cats. And so uh, this may be a way, a new way of kind of, instead of that death by a thousand cuts, maybe it's the actual, the throat grab that we see with kind of larger big cats, as opposed to smaller, uh, the dogs that are generally like smaller, but you know, wolves are still very intimidating animals, but they kind of rarely go for the throat grab or the muzzle grab. Uh, they're going for primarily that hunt and chase and just tire out strategy. Uh, Allosaurids are probably doing that big cat grab and choke. Uh, alternatively, uh, one interpretation is that they open their mouth wide and kind of hack with their front, uh, their top teeth uh, in like a hatchet-like motion. Uh, that just feels kind of weird to me. <laughs> uh, maybe it's right, but it just doesn't make sense to me. But I'm not one of the dinosaur experts, so uh, we'll leave that up to them. Uh, I'm just delivering what I've seen. <laughs> Uh, so let's start talking about different kinds of allosaurids. Uh, so uh, Sinoraptor is uh, one of the earliest one of these, uh, and the name translates to Chinese thief. If you see Sin or Sino, uh, that often refers to Chinese, and they're usually found in, in China. So this is a dinosaur from China, and uh, the name, the raptor name, uh, which again translates to thief, and we'll see that suffix raptor 
uh, quite a lot throughout the rest of the class, especially coming up at the end of this week, uh, that might cause a little bit of confusion because Sin Raptor is not actually one of the quote unquote raptors, it's an Allosaurid. So uh, I'm not sure why they named it that. Um, it is a little bit more like uh, slender than some of the other Allosaurids, but you see here it's, it's still pretty beefy. Uh, I'm not sure why they would give it that raptor name, but they did. And again, in paleontology, uh, when a name is assigned, it's capped and it's given priority unless there's an earlier name that tends to have it. So this name stuck in the, the person that described it named it has that right. So that's what it is. Um, but their size and the lifestyle of these uh, Chinese allosaurids is fairly similar to the North American Allosaurus itself, uh, but there's a little bit less competition around in Asia. So we saw last time that uh, there's ceratosaurs around in the Morrison Formation of North America. There's that big old Torvosaurus, the megalosauroid, uh, in the Morrison Formation. Uh, the Allosaurus are the prominent uh, primary predator in that environment, but they have a lot of other carnivores around in that environment. Uh, large carnivores from China are uh, relatively scarce. Uh, they're pretty rare from the Shishugo formation of China, and Sin Raptor is the largest. So uh, even though it's not like huge by carnivorous dinosaur standards, it is the largest one around at this time on the Asian continent. And so again, this is an example of not all dinosaurs are alive in the same locations at the same time. And as these continents are separating and as they're floating away from each other, as Pangaea is breaking up and drifting apart, uh, different dinosaur fauna, different associations of different dinosaurs are developing differently in different areas. And so Synraptor is the apex predator in this environment and it's not competing with all those other big carnivores like Allosaurus is forced to do in North America. Uh, the next one is uh, Metriacanthosaurus. Uh, that translates to medium spined lizard. So Metria medium, uh, cantho spine and lizard saurus. Uh, it's defined by sort of these kind of mid-sized projections that come up off the top of the spinal vertebrae. Uh, they don't form a fin or a sail like in Spinosaurus. So, uh, you see that they're uh, not to that degree. Uh, they're probably attachment points for muscles. So when you see kind of elongated bones with these large surfaces, it's probably like attachment points for muscles. Just again, this is an indication that uh, these things are getting larger. You see the body size here. Uh, generally over time, there's this increase in body size of these carnivorous theropod dinosaurs and they need bigger muscles to support the bigger body mass. And these spines might be uh, an attachment point here. Uh, they're not really like anomalously large for a, a dinosaur of this type. So I'm not sure why they focus so much on that, uh, but that's what they named it for is these kind of medium extensions on there that uh, gave the dinosaur some muscle. You see on this life reconstruction, uh, again, you see that kind of double keratinous crest on the front. It's not a horn like in, uh, Carnotaurus, uh, but it's a crest. And again, keratin is like the stuff that your fingernails are made out of. So it's it's hard, it's rigid, but it does decompose. So it's not really preserved here. You don't see uh, on the skull here, it's not preserved, but you see evidence of it on the skull. So there's like ridges that it would attach to that you can see, but the crest itself is not preserved. Um, there's also uh, Yangchanosaurus in China that, um, so this is a, a European specimen. Uh, it may be equivalent to something in, in China. And again, uh, so there might be some other um, sort of larger carnivores in China that we have a little bit less evidence of or a little bit more sparse evidence for. Uh, so moving on to Allosaurus itself. So Allosaurus is, is the species that this whole group is named for. Uh, it get, translates to different lizard again, because of that odd hourglass-shaped vertebra that probably reduced weight, uh, you start seeing the bones becoming kind of hollow. So again, we're starting to see this kind of weight savings as the theropods are evolving over time 
towards the kind of bird line dinosaurs, we're starting to see these adaptations that are leading towards that. Or le we're starting to reduce the skeletal weight, starting to get more windows in the skull to reduce the skull weight, starting to get these air sacs in the body. We're starting to lighten up the body frame, uh, even as body size overall is sort of increasing. And so again, uh, this is the dinosaurs of the Morrison formation figure that we've seen before. Uh, here is Allosaurus fragilis, the most common one. Uh, there's Epantarius and Sorophaginax, which we'll talk about in a bit, but uh, these are probably just larger uh, Allosaurus. And so, but again, we're competing with Torvosaurus, Ceratosaurus. Uh, there's other large carnivores around in the Morrison of North America. But Allosaurus is by far the most numerous, most successful. It uh, makes up 75% of carnivorous specimens. So if you're in the Morrison and you find a theropod carnivorous dinosaur tooth or fragment or something like that, uh, it's the majority of the time it's going to be from an Allosaurus just because there are just so many of them. Uh, they did have competition, but they were winning that competition. They were very, very numerous. Uh, you can see by the size that they're not tremendously large. So like compared to something like a Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, Allosaurus, at least most of the Allosaurus, were um, a little bit smaller, but still compared to a human, quite large. Uh, so they would be like mid-sized, although I would call them large and I would call the others probably extra large. Um, so they're probably fighting, uh, I should say, they're probably hunting sort of mid-sized sauropods. Uh, mid-sized healthy adult sauropods. Uh, they're probably not taking on the full-sized healthy adults. And again, what we see in like modern predators is that uh, again, being a predator and attacking and a very large herbivore is, is a dangerous game. Uh, even something like a gazelle or a wildebeest or a zebra uh, they're very muscular, they're very heavy, they're very stoutly built, they've got hooves, they're really good at kicking, uh, and if you've ever been bit by a horse, uh, that hurts too. Uh, even though they're not carnivorous, like bites still hurt, uh, they have a lot of different ways of defending themselves, uh, and that's very true of the sauropod dinosaurs as well, the herbivorous dinosaurs, uh, they're not going to go easily, they're not going to get taken down easily. And so if you're a carnivorous dinosaur, you don't want to take on a full size, healthy adult, just like animals have strategies for kind of winnowing out the herd and trying to separate off slower, sicker, older animals. That's probably what was going on here as well. Um, if a large adult was sick or injured, then they might be able to take it on there, but they weren't going to be attacking the gigantic healthy adult individuals in most cases. Um, one thing we see is that, again, the, the body size is increasing here. These things are becoming kind of more and more dangerous over time. Uh, what we don't see, though, is that the brain size is still relatively small uh, compared to the body size. It's not really growing at a relative rate. And so uh, later on, more derived theropods, like, again, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, we've talked about T-Rex brain and how advanced it was and how good their vision was, how good their smell was, uh, how good they could hear kind of low frequency sounds. Uh, that's probably not quite as true of Allosaurus, uh, not saying that they were stupid or slow, but they weren't at that level. So uh, moving along to uh, Sorophaginax, and again, uh, that's kind of one of these larger Allosaurids. In fact, it may just be a very large specimen of Allosaurus maximus. It might just be a, a, a new name for something that's already described. Uh, so as these dinosaurs grow, they change their size. And so like, it's very difficult to separate like a young juvenile of a species from like, is that a small, a big enough body change to be a whole different species? Or is that just a juvenile of a different species? Or like a very old adult that's had its full life to grow and reaches like an abnormally large size. Uh, in some cases, that could be interpreted as a totally different species because it's much larger than most of the other ones that we've found. And so we see this a lot of times where 
uh, these larger specimens are given like a new genus name and they may in fact just be larger specimens of a genus that's already been named. Uh, so Sorophaginax may in fact just be a large Allosaurus maximus, but uh, its name translates to ruler of blizzard eaters. So phage is to eat. Uh, and it's the largest known Jurassic carnivore. So of all the carnivorous dinosaurs on all the continents during the Jurassic, uh, Sorophaginax is probably the largest. Uh, and it was preying on sauropods. It was a sauropod specialist. It was probably taking down these large herbivorous dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation. I hadn't even really been showing these large herbivorous dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation because those earlier, uh, more basal theropods probably weren't able to take these things down. They were could probably feed on the juveniles. They could probably feed on the sick or the old. But uh, these massive carnivores, uh, they would maybe go after the adults, but they would still probably struggle. Again, look at the size of these things. Uh, here is a human for scale. Uh, here is Sorophaginax at about the same scale. You can see the humans here are about the same size. Uh, Diplodocus, uh, Brachiosaurus, just massive. Again, here's a Brachiosaurus compared to an elephant for scale. These things are huge. And they're very dangerous. Look how muscled it is. Look at the musculature on the neck. Look at the musculature on the tail. Diplodocus has this long whip tail. There's lots of ways for these things to defend themselves. They've got these pointy, like, hooved almost feet. Uh, it's not an easy game. And so even the massive carnivorous dinosaurs probably would have avoided directly taking on uh, Diplodocus. In fact, you can kind of see here, this is a skeleton of Sorophaginax compared to a Diplodocus, and you see the relative size here, uh, it barely comes up to its knee. So it's gonna be tricky <laughs> to take on these large, large dinosaurs. Uh, and you've gotta kind of use the strategy to separate out the weaker individuals, separate out the younger individuals, separate out the injured individuals. Um, and so back to the cladogram here, uh, that's the Elosauridae. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the Carcharodontosauridae. So Carcharodontosauridae, the name is getting really long here. I almost had to change the font size so it would fit. Uh, it translates to shark tooth lizard. So Carcharodon is the genus name for uh, sharks that great white sharks belong to. So specifically it's great white shark tooth lizard. It's named for the shape of their teeth and the wrinkled enamel of their teeth. So you see here, these are some Carcharodonto sort of teeth, and you see the wrinkles in the enamel along this way, you see kind of that uh, pseudo serrated edge there. Uh, and this is a comparison to great white teeth. You see a very similar shape where the, the back of the tooth is kind of flat-ish. Back of the tooth is kind of flat-ish. The back of the tooth here is kind of flat, kind of flat, kind of flat. And then you've got this kind of strong recurve on the front surface with these tiny little serrations there just really good at tearing through flesh, tearing up meat. Uh, these Carcharodontosaurids are the largest early Cretaceous carnivores. So uh, we're kind of through the Jurassic. So the Allosaurids were kind of dominant in the Jurassic, at least in the North American continent and over into Asia. Uh, in the early parts of the Cretaceous, uh, Carcharodontosaurids are kind of dominant in most ecosystems on uh, most continents, and so they're just everywhere. Um, but by the late Cretaceous, about 90 million years ago, uh, we see that they're replaced in North America and in Asia, the northern continents, by tyrannosaurs. So tyrannosaurs start taking over around 90-ish million years ago in North America and in Asia. Uh, and on the Gondwanan continents, like uh, Africa, South America, Australia and probably Antarctica, although we have lesser fossils from there. Uh, in the Gondwanan continents, it's Abelosaurs that we talked about earlier that really kind of rise to take over the dominant role. But here in the early parts of the Cretaceous, it's really the Carcharodonts on all the continents and all the ecosystems that are dominant. Uh, so let's look at uh, in Tanzania, so Northern Africa, uh, Veteruptrisaurus, uh, that's a mouthful, Veteroprestosaurus. 
which translates to old saw shark. So uh, vetter, so like veteran, somebody that's more experienced or older. Uh, pristis, pristis is uh, um, saw sharks. It's a genus for saw sharks and Saurus albius lizard. So old saw shark lizard. Uh, it, the old part comes from it's the most basal, the oldest known of these carcarodontosaurids. So this is the most primitive, most uh, basal member of this group. And uh, again, we see sort of this uh, trend in increasing size. So along with Saurophaginax that's in North America, this African dinosaur uh, is very large. It's this, again, this continuing trend that we see from the tri late Triassic when we're competing with Rawasukians, competing with Phytosaurs, competing with the Triassic other uh, crocodilomorphs, the Pseudosuchians, uh, Coelophysis, Dilophosaurus, relatively small body size. At the end, at the uh, sorry, at the end Triassic, there's that extinction, and the body sizes start increasing. We start seeing the Ceratosaurs, and now we're starting to get into these larger Carnosaurs. And so, uh, Veteropristosaurus, you see in blue here, uh, that's the body size. Uh, the early, uh, more basal Abelosaurids that we talked about last time and Elaphrosaurus, uh, those are smaller. One we're going to talk about later, Carcharodontosaurus itself, uh, that's a more derived member of this. You see that increasing body size trend. Now, we don't see it in all of the different dinosaurs, there, but in general, overall, there's this trend of increasing body size with these carnivorous dinosaurs. So we kind of have to ask the question of why? Well, we talked earlier about the sauropod dinosaurs. They're also having a trend of increasing body size. If you want to compete with these and you want to hunt these large-bodied sauropods, uh, even the juveniles are now very large. Uh, and so being a bigger carnivorous predator helps you take down bigger herbivorous prey. And so it's kind of this arms race. As herbivorous dinosaurs get bigger, the carnivorous dinosaurs get bigger. As herbivorous dinosaurs get even bigger, the carnivorous dinosaurs get even bigger. And these things are hunting sauropod dinosaurs. They're specializing in that. They have the ability now to take those things down. And so as they grow, they have to keep up. So this is known from the Jurassic uh, Tendaguru formation in, in Tanzania. And uh, again, along with Sauropaginex, probably the largest Jurassic carnivore. These, these are apex predators of the Jurassic, but we're going to see through time that these things eventually are small compared to some of the things that come last. Uh, so a slightly larger version of this, uh, Acrocanthosaurus translates to high spine lizard. So uh, Metriocanthosaurus was medium spine lizard. Acrocanthosaurus, like acro, like acrobat. Uh, Acrocanthosaurus is high spine lizard defined by these long extensions off of the vertebrae. So here's the backbone, the vertebrae. Uh, you see these long spinal extensions kind of sticking up. Uh, it's not to the degree of a Spinosaurus sail, but initially this material was actually assigned with the Spinosaurid. So it was initially kind of mistaken for a Spinosaurid. Uh, you see that the skull structure is very different. The hand structure is very different. Three fingers versus four. Uh, the arms are much more reduced than a Spinosaurus arms, but still useful, so still very strong and powerful. Uh, they probably did use their arms for grasping and clawing, uh, just not to the extent that Spinosaurus would have. Uh, so if it's not a big old Spinosaur fin, then what is it? Well, just like with Metriocanthus, it's probably attachment points for muscles. This thing is even bigger it's scaled up even farther to support that frame. It needs even more musculature. And so this is probably supporting large muscles. Uh, you might have, but it might still form like kind of a low ridge along the back, not really a true sail per se, but definitely visible on living animal. Uh, and so Arcanthosaurus represents the largest predator in the early Cretaceous of North America. And it's preying on sauropods. It's preying on ankylosaurs, the armored herbivorous dinosaurs that we're gonna talk about next week. 
or actually next module. Um, so this is a true large apex predator uh, out competing a lot of the smaller things that were around. And again, this is this increasing body size going from the Triassic really small, Jurassic bigger, kind of getting into the larger sized dinosaurs, uh, into the early Cretaceous, we really see this scale up of these predatory dinosaurs, but not everywhere. So uh, if we go to Europe, uh, concavenator uh, translates to uh, Quenca, Quenza hunter, uh, named for the Quenza province of Spain, and hunter because it, it's a predator, it's, it's hunting for its living. Uh, it's a kind of medium-sized European carnivore, which is, again, uh, much smaller than the dinosaurs that we just talked about or will talk about. It's much smaller than its North American and South American, the northern, the other northern continents, uh, and it's even smaller than uh, the African uh, apex predators. Uh, so it's kind of medium-sized, but again, compared to a human, that's still pretty large. Uh, you can see the scale of the fossil here. Uh, you can also get a good idea. So a lot of times when we see these fossils, a lot of the pictures that I've shown you are the fossils kind of fully reconstructed and reassembled into the life form of the dinosaur, how, how it was arranged when it was living. Uh, this is what you generally start with. In fact, this is a very uh, well-preserved specimen that's mostly articulated. And uh, it's pretty easy to put this thing back together, but uh, you can see that it's a lot, it's complicated. Uh, putting these things back together is a very elaborate 3D jigsaw puzzle. And even in this case where it's mostly still together, it can be tricky to put it back into life position. And again, we've seen, uh, for example, putting the skull on the wrong end of that plesiosaur. Uh, those sort of mistakes happen here because it's a pretty complicated game. Eventually those mistakes come to light, but uh, one thing that's very uh, interesting about this particular specimen is that it has this kind of weird hump, uh, kind of right in a uh, little bit uh, frontal of the, the pelvis. And so what is this? So again, that form follows function. If you see a weird form on something, uh, why is it there? What does it do? Well, uh, this has been proposed as a thermal regulator. So Remember that Spinosaurus's sail was also originally proposed as maybe a thermal regulator radiator thing like Demetri the earlier Demetrodons from the Permian, not dinosaurs, remember? Um, so maybe it's just a thermal regulatory thing. Uh, again, the default, if you have a feature that is kind of anomalous and you don't really know how to explain it, uh, maybe it's a display thing. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that kind of up on the top uh, upper portion of the arms, uh, there's some uh, little bumps on the bone that have occasionally been interpreted as quill knobs. So if you look at modern bird bones, especially on the wing bones, uh, in, some in some cases you can actually see little knobs where the flight feathers would attach, where the larger, more prominent feathers would attach. They actually leave scars. There's actually evidence of the attachment points on the bone called quill knobs. Uh, there are some bumps on the upper portion of the arm here that's sort of been interpreted as quill knobs, but other researchers have said kind of the, the location kind of really high up on the arm, and then also kind of the spacing is a little bit weird for quill knobs. But uh, if it is quill knobs, it's the only evidence in carnosaurs of feathers. And so again, there's this significance of if we see evidence of feathers in one member of the one branch of this tree, there's implications for the other members around it on the tree. And so this would be uh, pretty, uh, pretty groundbreaking if we actually find true evidence that these are feathers, it would have implications for uh, all the other carnosaurs. It would make it much more likely that they have feathers. Again, this is a kind of smaller body form, uh, not small per se, but smaller compared to some of the larger ones. Uh, if any of the carnosaurs had feathers, we would sort of expect it to be some of the smaller members. And so, you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Again, we don't know at this point, uh, there will be more examination of the fossils that we have, and there will be examination of fossils that we may find. Hopefully you find more material. And again, kind of just keep locking in on a more and more correct answer over time. 
uh, it might be proven that they're not cool knobs and that will be thrown out, that idea will be thrown out and replaced by whatever comes next. So always kind of in theory, con converging on a, a more correct version of the truth. But again, because we don't have a time machine, we're never gonna be able to go back in time. We're never gonna be able to see these things alive and living and behaving and all of our reconstructions are wrong to some degree. Uh, a lot of them are probably useful though. And, and again, like all these paleo arts, it's just nice to see the flesh put on the bones. Uh, there are artistic liberate, liberties taken here. There are educated guesses, but it's done with knowledge of what this, what the bone structure is on this animal, what the bone structure is on other closely related animals, looking at bone structure on modern living animals, and just trying to put together the story and making the best educated assumptions and inferences and interpretations that we can. Uh, the next one is uh, Xiao Shilong. Uh, I probably butchered that name. Uh, sorry, I need to work on my Chinese pronunciation. Uh, I definitely should spend time doing that. Um, so it translates to shark tooth dragon, which uh, is described from the late Cretaceous Ulan Suche formation. Uh, in China. So it's a Chinese name that translates to shark tooth dragon because it was found in China and described by Chinese researchers. Uh, it's another one of these kind of medium sized carnivores. It's not as large as some of the others that we've talked about today. Uh, but it's significant because again, there's, there's not a lot of large carnivorous dinosaurs from this time in this location. We talked earlier about uh, not having a lot of competition for the apex predator role in Asia, in China. Uh, and later on, uh, we do see that large tyrannosaurids kind of take over. Uh, the northern continents, North America especially, is dominated by tyrannosaurids. Asia becomes dominated by tyrannosaurids. On the southern continents, it's mostly the abelosaurs that maintain dominance, but uh, what we see is that at this point in time, uh, this far into late Cretaceous, that transition hasn't really happened yet. So these are still the dominant apex predators. Uh, that shift is sort of this weird timing, sort of coinciding all around the globe where there's this rapid change in who are the dominant apex predators. And it sort of corresponds at least roughly with a shift in who are the dominant sauropod herbivores. There's this transition between the large uh, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, sauropods, and then towards the end of the Cretaceous, uh, right up to the extinction, the herbivores start to be dominated by uh, the hadrosaurs, so the, the quote unquote duck-billed dinosaurs. And so these things were really kind of sauropod specialists that were adapted and evolved to hunt the large sauropods. Uh, when the large sauropods start fading away, uh, maybe because of a climate shift, uh, the earth might be getting a little bit drier here, less vegetation, uh, something along those lines. Something happens in the climate, there's a shift away from sauropods and towards hadrosaurs on the herbivore side, and it coincides with this shift from uh, from these, the carnosaurs, to tyrannosaurids in North America and Asia and the abelosaurids in the southern continents. Uh, but uh, before that happens, though, uh, Giganno, Gigantosaurus, so not Gigantosaurus, that's a different dinosaur, uh, it translates to giant southern lizard. Uh, it's named after its obviously enormous size uh, and where it's found in South America. So at this point here, uh, the carnosaurs are still dominant in South America. The abelosaurs haven't taken over yet. Uh, these things are again specializing in hunting those big sauropod dinosaurs. That transition to hadrosaurs hasn't happened yet, um, but these things are truly massive. Uh, so they have the largest skull of any theropod, uh, measured at 1.6 meters, and it might be longer than that. Uh, some measurements are as high as 1.9 meters if you have all the material. Um, but uh, again, this is a, a human for scale. Here's a life reconstruction of Gigantosaurus. This looks a little bit too spindly maybe. There might be a little bit more musculature on this. Uh, looks a little top heavy. Looks like it might actually fall over. 
remember the center of mass for a bipedal dinosaur has to be above the hips here. Uh, to me, it looks like it's a little bit forward, but there are all these new adaptations of opening windows in the skull to lessen the weight, uh, those oddly shaped vertebrae to lessen the weight, starting to see the pneumatized bones. So uh, maybe it is correct, but it, it does look a little top heavy to me. Uh, but uh, what we see that is that into the Cretaceous here, into the late Cretaceous, that size trend, that increase in size trend is really kind of at its max. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, which comes later, is also very large. But uh, what we see is that the largest theropods by this point in the mid to late Cretaceous are about as big as they're ever going to get. Uh, we see Tyrannosaurus very large, Gigantosaurus, Ar 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 Acrocanthosaurus, Sauropaginax, Carcharodontosaurus, Spinosaurus, which we talked about last time. Uh, these are all in, in meters here. Uh, you can see the relative sizes compared to humans. Uh, th they are different in size. Uh, and again, what does it mean to be the largest dinosaur? Are you talking the longest dinosaur from, from tip of nose to tip of tail? Are you talking about the tallest dinosaur from foot to hip? Are you talking about the heaviest dinosaur? So what does massive really mean? Uh, Spinosaurus is probably still the largest theropod to ever exist, but remember that it might actually be mostly piscivorous, so it might be mostly eating fish. Uh, it might not even actually count as a truly like macro carnivorous dinosaur. And so uh, it's really maybe among these to see who's the actual largest predator of all time. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex might have the edge in that case, but Gigantosaur Giganotosaurus is pretty close here. Um, and again, here's like just uh, when they live the time frame here, the length. So length is pretty close between Tyrannosaurus. Uh, Gigantosaurus is uh, potentially much heavier. Uh, but again, uh, reconstructions of mass, reconstructions of length, a uh, lot of error bars on here. Uh, what we can say, though, is that these large theropods are all fairly close in size, close enough that it's a big debate about which one might be the largest. And so why? Well, they might all be kind of converging on like the upper possible limit of how big a theropod dinosaur can actually get. There's a limit to how large a bipedal uh, dinosaur can get. You need to support the weight of all that muscle. You need to support the weight of that big skull and big jaws and all those teeth. Uh, bone has a limited strength capacity. Muscles have a limited amount of weight that they can actually carry. And if you add more muscle, you add more weight. And at some point it becomes counterintuitive and you start swinging back the other way. So there is a mechanical limit to how big this bipedal theropod carnivorous dinosaur body frame can get. And uh, at this point, we're probably at it. These are these very large examples of theropods are probably right up against that limit. Uh, and then we see something very similar in the sauropod dinosaurs where there's a limit to how big a quadrupedal large herbivorous dinosaur can get. And we start seeing that there's a lot of them that cluster right at the upper limit of that. Uh, by the late Cretaceous, dinosaurs are about as big as they're ever going to get. And they, start converging on that really big body size. And it's probably as big as something on land can get with the kind of uh, four legs, five fingered body frame that we all inherited from Tiktaalik way back in the Paleozoic. Uh, so that's all I got for today. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you're enjoying the class. Hope you're sticking along. Make sure you're keeping with the schedule. And if you have any questions, make sure you reach out to me. Uh, goodbye.